And it probably was, um, a, you know, you could visualize it and see signs of it when they're five, six, seven years old. You wouldn't Maybe make it by out. anxiety. Right. And There's people right. that have anxiety right. uh, get hooked on pills much faster. Correct. Because I, you know, Correct. And as that's being a psychologist, right. I know that right. those so take medications, dependent, yes. Right. Dependent on pills, right? Mm -hmm. So they get dependent, and the reality is that those medications soothe their brain. Mm -hmm. If the patient isn't going to the right physician or if the physician isn't asking the right questions, that patient might find, hey, my sleeping pills really, really make me feel better. I'm lying in bed at night without my sleeping pill and my brain is going and I mm -hmm. can't turn it down and I'm thinking mm -hmm. about tomorrow's um, problems and what happened today. And when I take my sleeping pill, wow, I'm really relaxed. And the fact of the matter is, is that those sleeping pills are very closely related chemically to Valium mm -hmm. and lorazepam and Ativan, um, they, uh, Xanax, and so the chemical structures are so close that the experts call them Zs because benzos has a Z in them. And so what we have to understand is that patients will find what works for them. Cough syrup with coating mm -hmm. is a common one. Because they, uh, they would have possibly serotonin disorders. Correct. They have a, they have a usually we call them um, a, a, a mono, monoamine neurotransmitter imbalance. It's a big, big way of saying mm -hmm. their chemicals in their brain that nerves use to communicate are imbalanced. Right. And once someone has imbalances of those chemicals, it involves nerves, it involves synapses, which is the space between two nerves, and it involves the, um, the chemical messages going back and forth. And basically, it's not just the brain, it's the brain and spinal cord. So your example of the patient with severe back pain you know, they also have a chemical imbalance related to that pain, and that chemical imbalance leads to messages going to their, um, I'll just say the pain center in their brain, mm -hmm. telling them how much pain they're in, and they form a chronic right. loop. And then the medicines like Vicodin and Norco, et cetera, help break that mm -hmm. for a short See, time. See, some people have strong pain tolerance, and right. other people don't. Correct. I mean, I can go to the dentist, and he can work on the tooth, and I never need uh, a shot to Novocaine. Wow. And he says, how do you handle it? I, I couldn't, he, the dentist himself Amazing. says, I can't go with, without Novocaine. I just have very strong pain tolerance. You do. So, so you know, that's why. It's amazing. Yes. Now, what I tell patients, though, is that when you have a, a, a very painful surgery procedure and you do experience a lot of pain, make sure that you only take these pain pills for two weeks and then stop them and go to something mm -hmm. else like Advil or Motrin, mixing that with Tylenol. There's other medicines we use by prescription and, and they're not addictive. And the doctors are actually, unfortunately, giving too many pills in the bottle right. and refilling. I know a friend of mine passed away from Tylenol overdose. Doctor was giving her, she was taking four to five Tylenol a day right. and didn't get a blood test. You're supposed to get a blood test maybe at the end of the month Correct. or something. For the liver. And for the liver. Right. And she got, she got, her son came over one day. She was completely yellow, hepatitis. She got mm -hmm. the whole thing. Right. And that's what happened. And people feel, oh, it's only Tylenol or it's only um, an Advil or something. Right. But if you take a lot of them, you know, this is what happens. It can go to the liver and cause a lot of damage of your liver. That's exactly right. And but the one thing about that, though, is that she went to the store herself, the pharmacy, and bought her Tylenol right. and didn't really recognize the risk. In the case of opioids, the patient's going to the emergency department with a sprained ankle and coming out with a bottle of 30 Norco. The patient's going to their doctor with migraines and getting a prescription for Vicodin, and then it's being refilled. And then what happens is the patient then becomes dependent and tolerant, needs more and more. They then need to go to other doctors and doctor right. shop or pretend they flushed it down the toilet and then the doctors yeah. will give them more. So it's the, the problem here is that patients do really have pain and physicians mm. have been really emphasized since 2002 to treat pain better. And so they're giving more pain meds and the statistic is, is um, mind boggling if you want to hear the difference. I want to go to also thank you, um, Adam, because it's very informative, and I hope that people really hear this because it's very important. Now, I know people, they go to methadone clinics, you know, methadone, um, and there is, a, there is a new drug that's out, if you can talk about it, uh, the difference between methadone and the new drug, which is suboxone, suboxone. or others, there's yes. Zubsolve to be balanced. Right. Competitors are generics, but, but really, uh, we'll use the term suboxone because yes. that's what people but I, know. But I was wondering, they go to methadone clinics and uh, they keep going every day or whatever it is. They get hooked on. I was just wondering, it's like a, almost a heroin addiction. They're t going to these places for a heroin addiction problem to cure it, but then they take the methadone and they really it, it, then it becomes. Um, 
also an addictive thing. How, how do they? How do you differentiate this? Okay, such such a um, such a difficult concept, but one that once um, the public understands it, it will really um, help elucidate the issue. So, someone can have an addiction to heroin, go to a methadone maintenance clinic, and by the way, methadone came out in the 1950s. Um, prior to that, doctors could not prescribe an opioid to someone addicted to opioids. It was against the law since 1914. In the 50s, they came out with methadone, and they forced them to be only given out in government-run clinics. In other words, you can have your own clinic, but you have to buy it from the government, and they have high, high amounts of regulation. Now, the thing about methadone is if you take too much methadone, it suppresses the breathing centers of the brain, and people die. They die of not breathing, and they just... Um, they, they will go into a, a coma for 10 minutes yeah. and they'll die. Another then, thing, then yeah. what's, the, what's the point of getting methadone okay. if, it's, right. if you Great have question. these side effects? Great I question. Don't, I so don't the answer is that in the 1950s, that was the only thing they could come up with mm -hmm. to replace the short-acting heroin. You see, short-acting drugs are more likely to cause addiction than long-acting ones. So Xanax is a classic example. That's, a lot of people take that for anxiety. It's only working in the system for about four hours. Right. And people and are like a roller coaster. You right. take it, and then you go down and take more. So then people want to take more and more. A lot of times people just take it if they're going on an airplane, and they right. have, uh, if they're anxious about airplane Correct. flying, so they take it before, and then they don't need it again. Exactly, Once and that's they, perfect, because yeah. if your flight is two hours, and you yeah. take it before, it lasts the airplane flight, and then you don't need it. But right. the, the issue is that some people have a predilection to addiction, or they have other mental health problems that lead them to be soothed by it, and they mm -hmm. take more and more. Now, getting back to what we were saying, the methadone basically is long acting. It has an extremely long half life. In doctor's terms, that means that the drug, when you take it, is how long is it in your system? Um, half of it's still working um, after you take it, and the answer is days, like multiple days. Okay. So the reality is that I'm, on, uh, I'm addicted to heroin, and I use my heroin um, by snorting it or injecting it, and usually by four or six hours later, I need my next heroin. With methadone, you can take it once a day and then take it the next day and the next, and each dose is overlapping such that you never go into withdrawal and you don't actually crave. How often do they go to the methadone clinic? Initially, every day. Every they go day. every day, and the problem with them is that a lot of these methadone clinics have been overloaded with patients. There was nowhere else to go, so there was a line out the door. The stigma of that is humongous. Yes. People don't want to go and stand in line at a place that everyone in the community knows is for junkies, addicts, right? Mm -hmm. I don't like those terms. Right. The language matters, but it's for people with an addiction. And so basically, methadone was all we had because it was long acting. But there are many, many people dying of methadone overdose because many people, after going every day, they get to go every three days and every five days and they'll stockpile it, they'll sell it. And if somebody has a relapse and they take a lot of it, they stop breathing. That's why Suboxone was, uh, the molecule was invented and the molecule for Suboxone is called buprenorphine. That is also long acting. The half life or half of it is still active after 36 hours. And, and, and there isn't a, where they, the side effects aren't as severe? Is that what you're Correct. saying? Well, the difference is that if I took a ton of buprenorphine, a ton of Suboxone, I mean so many of them all at once, I wouldn't die. I would just sleep for a long time yeah. and wake up. It doesn't suppress my breathing unless I mix it with large amounts of so, valium or alcohol. So are they going to uh, replace the methadone clinics with Suboxone? No, there's a role for methadone clinics and I think that might go beyond our talk, but there's a role for methadone clinics, there's a role for um, prescribing Suboxone, and there's a role for another drug called Vivitrol, which is not an opioid. Um, but I want to just focus on one topic here. That's that the, um, the patients who take methadone and do well on it yeah. and take it for years and years, those patients are not, they're not, um, they're not stuck on it in the sense that it's a bad thing for them. They're not now addicted to methadone. Some people say, oh, now it's the, the industrial complex of medicine. You, you know, I was using Norco, but now I'm stuck on this factory-made drug. But the reality is that the methadone is helping someone's behavior change. They're no longer lying, cheating, stealing. They're back with their family. They're back um, you know, having goals in their life. So methadone saves lives as long as it's used appropriately and prescribed right. Suboxone's the same way. I don't believe that taking Suboxone for the rest of your life is actually a bad thing. I don't believe that people are um, still addicted to a, an opioid. I think that what matters is that 
I, and, I take a medicine and that not, makes me and do not, better in And my they're life. not getting it off the street. I think that's really right. important. Heroin gets mixed with fentanyl. Correct. There's another drug that's right. out there that's very... Fentanyl. Fentanyl. It's highly dangerous. It looks like heroin, but it can really kill people. And that's, you know, that's where a lot of deaths come in because right. a lot of the heroin is mixed with this drug. Right. I think it comes from China. Actually, no. Oh, is it from Mexico? Where is it? Mexico. Oh, so, it is Mexico. So, okay. um, you know about yes. El Chapo, um, yes. this man who yes. escaped twice yes. from... Yes. So his Sinaloa cartel brings in the vast majority of heroin to the United States, and the majority of that, probably 90 to 95%, goes to Chicago, not anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And then they have 100,000 gang members in the Collar counties. And this answers your question, why in our white upper middle class suburban families is it happening? Well, because there's money there, and when some people start using, they introduce it to others, and it's cheap. And if I'm already stuck on my Vicodin or Norco because my doctor kept refilling it, and I don't have enough money, and I'm stealing my parents' car or things from the house, and I don't have anything else to steal, it's cheaper to go from an $80 oxycodone pill right. to a $10 dollar bag of heroin. And but so they go to that. mixed with this horrible thing. Right. And what happens is they mix it with fentanyl and other things right. on purpose because they, they get a bigger, better high in response. And you know what's fascinating about that? What's fascinating is that when there's news reports about 40 people dying from, from heroin laced with fentanyl, the people who are addicted want it more. Their brain has been changed. If I was addicted to something, I imagine I would say, oh my gosh, that stuff called black tar or whatever, I never want to take it. People right. die. But those folks who are addicted want it more because there's something different about their brain. They've changed the brain with the addiction, right. and they get drawn to it like a moth to a flame. And so that is the problem here is that we have to recognize that we have to help their brain return to the way it was before so they how were do addicted. You, how, we've got a few minutes here. How do you mm -hmm. counsel people in, in, you know, it, with this disorder? Okay, so the first thing to say is for opioids in specific, pain pills and heroin, uh, patients should be in medication-assisted treatment. We got two minutes. No problem. So, Adam, so, so we can come back if you want, but medication. But I would yeah. like to invite you back because sure. there's still so much more. Sure. And Walgreens is now carrying. They're um, carrying um, Narcan, which is naloxone, so and they mean not, they always carried it, but they're able to dispense it without a doctor's yes, prescription. Yes, if you have a, if you if an, you overdose. an overdose. And that's what Live for Lolly has yes. done. Live for Lolly is part of the Lake County Opiate Initiative, and right. actually, Live for Lolly made sure that every first responder has it in their pocket, and they passed yeah. Lolly's law. Named Lally for Alex is, Lally. It was named for Alex La Liberté, Le, who right. died in from 2008 an, from an yes. overdose. A and beautiful, multi-talented yeah, young boy who went to the, Stevenson High yes, School, I and he that. basically overdosed from heroin before his family ever knew he was addicted. Yes. And so this young man is exactly an example of someone who you would never know. And so had someone had naloxone in that family and found him down in the first 10 or 12 minutes, gave him a yes. shot, he would sit right so, up and be alive and go something. for treatment. And, we, and I think our police force carry it now. Correct, all the first all responders. All the first responders right. carry it. And They've well, saved and 55 lives yeah. since Christmas Day just right. because they have it in their pocket and they don't have to wait for an ambulance to come. Right, and that, that is, because a lot of people don't even, when you hear about addictions, or I mean not addictions, but suicide, a lot of these children, they didn't want to commit suicide. Their drugs got mixed up. They got laced exactly. with something else, and they had no idea. Maybe they used it with a cold medication. Right. They, were on a, they had a cold. Or, or alcohol. They, alcohol, or anti, an anti, uh, if they were on a, an antibiotic or something, mm -hmm. they mixed it with something not realizing it's deadly. I would and just say, they, it, it, the word I like to use, complete suicide, because it's the disease doing it. And just quickly, what I would say is that in a moment of anxiety and impulsivity, which is coming from the mental health side I was talking about, they often take more than they're supposed to because they feel so horrible, and then they die. And we don't always call that... Um, you know, what it really is is a mental health issue. We just call it the drug killed them. And so we have to recognize that we have to treat both. We have to put them on the right medicines for their mood and anxiety, and also medication-assisted treatment for the opioids, which would be methadone, Suboxone, or Vivitrol. The studies show that if you're not on one of those, you're overwhelmingly more likely to die. Well, I think that, you know, this program that we're talking about and all these things that you're doing is marvelous, Adam. Uh, this is Dr. Adam Rubenstein. Stein, I want to see Dr. Okay. Norman Stein, <laughs> and you know you're, he's you're an internist. It isn't just that you're you're trained as an intern, so you could see the other parts of the body, what sure. it's doing to no not just a psychiatrist that's just training one type of thing. You're more you treat well-rounded. You're well-rounded in the field, and I really appreciate that you came on the show today, and I want to thank you very much 
for coming, taking out of your busy practice with all your people to be on the show today. I am very thankful for